Whoa, yes, I think I do believe too. One person you touch, that's all you need to do, because you can affect stuff. And um, you know, everyone today, you know, this is one thing, actually Deepak Chopra, when he's going to be hopefully joining us via Skype, uh, he too believes that. And uh, Deepak and I have been talking about it for a while, about connecting. He believes, um, he, been, he and I have been talking about launching a happiness network, because he believes that if I have three happy friends and he has three happy friends, if we connect the networks, the collective is happier. And I think at some level it really works. So next time you see a stranger, share a hug <laughs> or just connect and just allow that serendipity to happen. But that's really what we're all about here at the 140 conference. Um, so the next uh, panel is actually about Blacksburg, Virginia. How many people here are on the internet back in 1995, 1996? So way back when, there was a town in America that was actually ahead of its time. It was one of the first wired communities. And I remember, I, back in 1995, I actually had a web magazine called Netwatch. And I actually read about these guys and wrote about what was happening in this town. And um, it, so Phil Bueller, um, who was, was at Ogilvy at the time, I met him actually in Hutchinson, Kansas, because he's very passionate about small town America. And even though he's from New York City, he, I actually met him in Kansas. And it was after hearing him talk and share his perspective on small towns and stuff, and I got to know Phil that he offered to do a presentation here 15 years later about what happened in Blacksburg and what's going on. And so he's brought with him a couple of people from the community, and he did some pioneering work himself 15 years ago. And I'd like to welcome to our stage uh, the panel. And Phil, it's, uh, it's yours. Thank you. I'll come after that. Such an intro. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, I first heard of Blacksburg in 1995. Uh, I was at the TED conference, and back then at the agency, everybody was talking about the 500-channel universe, and, uh, and that was going to be the next big thing. And at, at the internet was only about 8% of households, maybe 5%. And the buzz at TED started to be about the internet. And um, just to set a stage, back in 95, it was computers had Pentium processors. Most of them ran DOS. I think Max ran OS 6. Uh, Mosaic was the browser. Um, Eudora was the, the number one email package. If you wanted to get on the internet, the biggest thing you did was go buy a, pack, a box called Internet in a Box. And it was really hard to get online. And so I was talking to Donald Norman at TED, and he said, who's a cognitive scientist, and he's written a bunch of books, one of them being emotional design, and he said, have you been to Blacksburg? I said, no, I haven't. He goes, oh, it incredibly, over 60% of the residents were online in 95, and thought, well, maybe this is where we're going to see where the future is going to happen. And so I went down with a team of researchers uh, to do a lot of ethnographies. We did. Uh, interviewed residents, businesses, the town, the government, and um, churches, church leaders, uh, and listened to their stories and heard where the world was going. And uh, we're going to talk about that uh, today. So, so Revan, uh, you came with me. Uh, Revan came to document, uh, as a photographer, what was going on. So what was your first impression when we, when we arrived? Well, back then is when uh, I was still producing TED. And in 95, we had the whole internet experience. We brought in a T1 line. And both Sun Microsystems and Silicon Graphics brought in machines, which we web surfed on. And people, even the TED audience, people were just amazed. Nobody had been on browsers. Nobody had been on the internet. So we went down to Blacksburg that year. And I mean, to, to, to focus on it was the guy running the grocery store already had a website and was doing e-commerce. And it was so unusual to see it without the, the, the high-powered TED audience being amazed and the, the very prosaic grocery store manager saying, well, of course. Um, I just want to give, read a list of Blacksburg first. Uh, in addition to ordering, first ordering of groceries online, uh, first real estate agency to showcase houses and make a sale online, first library to offer free internet, first school system to wire every school with internet, first residential broadband, and, and perhaps most importantly, the world's first cyber bar. So, 
So, um, Andrea, uh, how did this all happen? Oh yeah, there's Bogans. There's Bogans, yes. Well, I was um, director of research for the Blacksburg Electronic Village for those early years and for eight years uh, going forward. And basically they wanted the university uh, partnered with the town and eventually with the uh, local phone company to make services that were available on the campus, which is essentially the internet access, uh, available when you went home in the evening, the students and faculty. It's a university town. Most people lived off campus. So it was really just a way to continue that uh, connection and continue to be, you know, work in the evening uh, uh, when you went home. And that was the in, uh, initial impetus and took a lot of training on our part and people learning how to connect their computer at their home uh, to the inter directly onto the internet. So who actually, how did, who actually put the wires in? How did that, uh, that? Well, a lot of the wiring was actually in place because people were just connecting over their phone lines, right? So they were just using uh, you know, dial-up modem access. The university made its own modem pool, which was available uh, on the campus, made that um, modem pool available to anyone in the community. It was good PR, uh, whether you were affiliated with the university or not. And uh, the uh, phone company um, you know, was basically routing from your home, you know, going through their central switch, which they upgraded for this purpose, uh, and from the central switch to our modem pool at the university. Um, so that was some of the, the hardware in the background. But basically, people were just you know, using dial-up modem. So, so once it was all, you could dial up. And I, I remember it was like $9 a month unlimited use. Uh, did they? It just went from 5% penetration to everybody in town was using it, or was it more complicated? Well, uh, it wasn't a big leap. This is a university town. Uh, Blacksburg uh, is home of Virginia Tech, which has a premier engineering college, as uh, many of you know. It's also a land-grant university. It has a big outreach mission. But we had to do a lot of training. You know, People had about 50% of the population back in 93 when we started. Uh, actually, we started, you know, planning this a few years before that. But, you know, actually p hooking people up, about 50% of households had computers. Uh, this is, you know, a college town. So they had computers, but, you know, very few of them were networked, as you say. So it took a lot of hand-holding and uh, uh, a lot of training uh, available through the university, through local organizations that we sponsored uh, training at and small businesses starting up to uh, provide that training. People hated their technology, but they loved their email. And I think that's another one of the things that I saw down there is that the email really was the killer app. It was, the, the web was a big deal. People liked it, people posted. But, you know, from, from grandmas to students to, to, you know, the store owners all through the population, people just wanted to talk to each other. It was, you know, early social media. In, in that sense. I guess the, the thing that uh, really struck me was that the percent of senior citizens that were online. Normally you'd think they'd be the last person, the last group of people to go online. And one of them I was talking to, I said, well, why, why'd you get online? And he's like, well, the, nobody's putting on the bulletin board anymore where the, you know, the bingo or the mahjong game is. It's online. And if you want to be part of the community, you've got to go online now to find out what's happening. It's kind of as if, as if Blacksburg picked up and moved down the road, and everybody was going to have to move down the road to stay part of the town. Because socially, you were going to be left behind. Um, so um, let me jump ahead, I think. Next slide, where's the, oh, forward button, there we go. So we went back last, uh, last year um, to figure out what, what's up next. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's the town, you know, looks remarkably the same. I mean, Bogan's is now 622 North, and, uh, and the websites look different, but the town is still a small town with a main street, and the campus is pretty much the same. Um, Andrew, what, what, what's changed in 15 years? Well, I think uh, that the main thing that has changed is this sense of comfort with these types of interactions. So everyone in the community expects information to be available online. They're comfortable 
uh, searching it, looking for it, interacting with other people in their groups. Uh, if you're going to be a leader of a local group, you better have uh, complete uh, uh, ease with uh, Twitter and Facebook and so on. And the, and the town government itself has been using this stuff for so long that the person who started the Twitter and Facebook account, young woman in the public relations uh, specialist you know, office, is, uh, is started it without asking permission uh, because you know, she knew it was going to be fine. It just messages used to come on people's email uh, announcements and updates that they had subscribed to. So just put it on the Facebook page, same uh, sort of headline, and, and over the Twitter account. So you know, in contrast to many other, uh, you know, another 80 prominent innovative cities and towns around the country who are using Facebook and Twitter, they're fairly nervous about what they're doing uh, from what I can read, but uh, not Blacksburg. Okay, when did New York get on uh, Facebook, Twitter, digital? Yeah, I think, what did we get? New York City got a chief digital officer in January of this year. So um, I think we're, we're a little behind there. Um, so, um, uh, Revan, what'd you, what'd you notice that changed when we went back? Uh, there was a really, really big cell tower in the middle of town. Is, is it on here? Or? No, no, I don't. no, we don't have that. <laughs> uh, one of these really outrageous kind of funny ones with I don't know how many antennas glued onto it over the last few years. Um, I contrasted from the first trip when we went down, I, I asked the guy who ran the local ISP, you know, so what did they do? Where's the internet? And he pointed to a patched scar in the, in the parking lot and said, well, they ran the wire there. Um, but a lot of it was it's the usage and it was the comfort level with, with um, anything digital, with communication, with social media. People just assumed it was going to be there. Um, the restaurant uh, that's here, the 622, which was just, it opened up on our, on our trip. The owner was an older, older man and they had a huge Facebook and Twitter presence and this big party announced ramped up and Foursquare and all that. <coughs> And he had this young uh, student uh, was, was doing everything, and we asked him, I remember the conversation, why, well, why'd you do it? Well, she said it was a good idea, and okay, so I did it. I trusted her completely to, you know, it should be online, it should be on social media. There was never a question of, is it a good idea? Is, is, it, is it gonna be okay? Yeah, I guess the, the, uh, the culture just seemed to absorb the latest, uh, the latest ways to connect with each other. Um, I, uh, uh, specifically when we went down there, was looking to see what was going on with geolocal services, because that was, looked like it was going to be the next big thing. And uh, a lot of people were using Foursquare. And, and to contrast how, and, you know, people are collecting badges and, and mayorships, but I thought um, a, a woman, Tina Merritt, had the best uh, use of Foursquare, I thought, that, uh, she basically checks uh, Foursquare in the morning to see which of her friends have checked in at the local pool, and then she'll tweet them and say, hey, can I drop my kids with you? And uh, I mean, is there a killer app for your iPhone? Uh, where to dump my kids today? Uh, uh, but now that's, I think, where one future of Foursquare and geolocal things are, is actually helping us connect with each other rather than get specials and deals. And, uh, and I think it's, the, the danger is there that in this small town, another uh, real estate agent who's totally on Twitter, uh, uh, Jeremy, Daly, uh, uh, Jeremy Hart said, uh, he's almost done with Foursquare. He goes, is there, is there a there there? You know, is, is, is there gonna be some benefit to us uh, rather than checking in and, and, and a benefit to the, the uh, uh, to Foursquare, and uh, I'd, almost, I'd, I'd love to invite uh, uh, Dennis Crowley down to, to Blacksburg to see what kind of applications you could develop for a small town, rather than more badges, more mayorships, you know. Is that Becky? I can't. Okay. <laughs> um, because I think if you could actually create those applications that help people connect with each other, uh, that's in a small town where it'll be very apparent on the surface that that's what's happening. Um, that's what the rest of America is going to want. Uh, just a few years down the road. Just a few years down the road, yeah. Um, so if, if Dennis wants to come with us uh, on our next trip, we'll, uh, we'll be happy to have him. So.
So um, I guess we have. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think the, the point you're, you're hitting on, which is uh, essential, is that it's always been social from the outset. And they had bulletin board systems in the early days with the well out in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, we've sort of moved all over and come back to making the technology uh, work so that it's easy for people to connect with each other in their social networks and extended social networks. And that's the way we, we function. That's how our psychology works. And uh, well, so things don't go viral unless we're touching, you know. We, uh, we can. Uh, once it, it turns into something social, that's when, when uh, stuff really happens. Um, so we've got a minute and 22 seconds left, and maybe a question or two, if there are any out there. Um, or, or we'll catch you at a break. Oh, I see an arm. <laughs> yeah. um, yesterday we heard Cory Booker talk about We have, a, we have a very diverse population, so if you go outside the town, it drops off very quickly. So the socioeconomic uh, situation is quite, um, you know, contrasted within the same school district. So I can guarantee you it's not the Blacksburg High School students who are dropping out. You know, my, my kids went there. It's in the top 100 in the country. But same district, you have kids where you know where they go home and there isn't indoor plumbing, uh, and you know one of the in the middle of on the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, yeah, so it's yeah. a very rural area of Virginia. But one of the most uh, significant things about studies, uh, recent studies on social media, is that unlike um, traditional uh, you know email and web browsing and internet use of that type, social media in particular especially coupled with cell phones, uh, does not have this strong socioeconomic uh, 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 correlation. Come, come talk to us outside later if you want to get some more. Thank you, sir.